All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Stefan Chanette, the CTO and founder of Attack IQ. Today, we're going to be talking about putting a threat informed defense into practice. Um, I'm going to be uh, moderating the panel with my two guests, and I'll let uh, them introduce themselves. Chris, why don't you go first? Yes. Uh, my name is Chris Kissel. I am a worldwide research director for IDC for Tier 2 SOC Analytics. Uh, in my service, I cover basically uh, network intelligence and threat analytic tools, uh, SOAR tools, XDR. Uh, but more importantly, I think about uh, how we level up uh, your basic Tier 1, Level 1 SOC analysts to make them more effective, hence Tier 2. And so those are my uh, practice areas in my coverage. Perfect. Russ? Um, Russ Nolan, I am a security engineer at Stripe, sitting on a team that is responsible for threat intelligence and adversary emulation. So we kind of put both of these uh, concepts into one under that roof instead of actually having, you know, the threat intelligence necessarily straight inside of our detection team. And so we're actually allowing that to to uh, drive some of this. So that's been where I am right now in the past, uh, was at Los Alamos National Lab for uh, you know 10 plus years, went to attack research, learned kind of the, the offensive side of things in the commercial sector, wasn't near as fun as the government sector and uh, uh, figured out over the years in, in the, uh, the, the commercial world, how uh, to really kind of leverage automation for for uh, defense purposes, or I mean, uh, leverage kind of offense for defense purposes. And that's where, um, you know, I've, I've been around you know, kind of this theme and around the, the adversary emulation stuff for about five to seven years now um, in various kind of stints along the way. And seeing it really where it is now has kind of grown to a like a peak. It's, it's pretty impressive. So Russ and I have known each other for quite some time. And um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, you say five, six years that you've kind of been on this path. Um, but, you know, what I think one of the aspects I think would be important in this conversation when we talk about threat informed defense is, you know, what, what were security teams, um, you know, in the last 20 years? You know, uh, Chris or Russ, you can kind of take this. Um, how, you know, what was the strategy how did that they adopted and the approach that they adopted before really really taking into account kind of the, the adversary mindset, you know, and, and then where are we today? I'd love to kind of look at that dichotomy. Yeah, I'll take it real quick from like a tools perspective. I, I think famously we always thought of things like uh, antivirus is like the whole thing. And, you know, really, if we're fair for maybe uh, six or seven years is really we'll call it the cloud era, right? So really there wasn't, for all intent and purposes, multi-tenancy. There wasn't, uh, you know, a, a kind of a dispersal of, of security and IT practices. You put everybody in the same building. You put them under uh, one security room. You had an Ethernet cord. You know, I mean, everything was sort of uh, uh, cloistered. Now, once you got to the idea of cloud, you had to do different things with uh you know, multiple uh, areas of egress, ingress, you know, mobile matters now, Wi-Fi matters, uh, data centers matter, you know. So you had to think of the tooling a lot differently. Really, threat intelligence uh, uh, behavior was really a function of malware strains. But you're finding out now that people think about things other than just malware. They think about impersonating identities. There's phishing. There's whole different attack vectors so, you know, you sort of have to scale your threat intelligence with it. Uh, I know we're going to get into larger themes about this because we've talked about it. But the idea is it's not just the idea of threat intelligence. It's sort of understanding what's happening in your network and what the potential blast surfaces are and how your team will respond to things, how your tools interplay together. So it, it's become uh, from a 2D problem to almost like a 3D problem, for lack of a better way to say it. I, I agree. Like there's some, Chris hit on some pretty good points about this. And I think about when I first started doing offensive stuff and I'm you're talking like 2002, 2001, somewhere in there. And, you know, at the time um, I was lucky enough to have like Val Smith as a mentor and, you know, doing things, but you didn't have the, the abundance of knowledge and resources that are out there now. Um, you know, now you can kind of, Hey, I want to, Google whatever it is that you're trying to do, and you probably have seven different techniques and how many hundreds of toolkits and sitting in front of you. 
back then it wasn't the case. And it was very unique to as an individual, what were you able to do or that small niche or that small set of people that knew how to do certain things do. And as you know, that landscape change and attackers change, right, to, well, now we have just a plethora of knowledge and a plethora of tools. Like that's where the industry kind of stopped evolving at the same time. And where I think like definitely the adversarial emulation and various other concepts like that, really the automation comes into play is great. I don't want to detect it for this one thing from uh, that one actor that I might be worried about that may never actually see us. But what happens if we throw any kind of variance to it? What happens if it's a dot one instead of a dot two at the end of it? Does our, you know, how does, how do we measure the impact of detection and prevention mechanisms? And I think that's the piece that is also like scaled or that we're needing to necessarily scale and where the, the, the threat informed and a lot of this adversary emulation concepts are really starting to actually come in um, is we've got the ability to automate a lot of this stuff. Because again, the data resource by which attackers have at their fingertips is so much more than what it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard, I heard a few things. Um, so, you know, the, the security teams of yesteryear, you know, the problems that they were dealing with were were maybe more simple, and then the infrastructure started to have more complexities. Um, the adversaries, uh, the the knowledge of what the adversaries were doing was was more readily readily available and being more shared. And so, Russ, as you put it, you could kind of start to to Google um, what was what was uh, you know what were key terms when before it was kind of a smaller set of individuals that had that knowledge. And as there were more complexities, you know, more automation was needed. Um, I think that's a perfect segue to kind of, you know, 2000, what, 14, 15, uh, MITRE, uh, you know, releases the attack framework. Um, and we can't, you know, we have, before we start really diving into threat-informed defense, we have to talk about the attack framework. Um, what did that do for the industry, you know, in terms of the, the, the lexicon and the, the knowledge base and the framework? What, what did it do for for the security teams, not just threat intelligence, but as a whole. I, I personally liked it from, I thought it broke down the way an attacker has to operate than the kill chain concepts or anything that was really kind of out there at the time. And, and I reference, uh, you know, I taught a, a black hat, started teaching black hat classes about 2011, 12, somewhere in there. And it was on offensive stuff uh, with attack research. And we, you know, the way we structured our class was recon post exploitation, lateral movement persists. I mean, like the slide, the sections of the titles were actually like you spent half a day on persistence and lateral movement. And so it mapped to me as a, especially as then somebody had had a bunch of hands on keyboard from a bad guy perspective you you have to think through those ways like how am i going to get to credentials what is the access how can i you know to, to go lateral i need to have access well what credentials then do i need and so it broke it down in a in a more um i would say kind of attacker based thought process than any of the other ones and i think that has been a success from both the offense and defensive side right it really helped kind of bridge that gap because for me is, is trying to now emulate and put all this automation place. I have that kind of common framework between the two, between a defensive side and kind of a, an offensive side to put that in place. And it's really the same concept. Um, even at Stripe, we've expanded it internally to have like, we've got a malware directory. We've got, you know, like, like those kind of concepts that it was really easy, but it was just simply like, how does a bad guy kind of have to go through an operation and what does that look like? And then now we've got the framework for it. it that's all that makes sense to me. And it has an, a couple of additional simple benefits, right? So for instance, I can honestly tell you that uh, in the last two years, it, if I think about all of the vendors, I mean, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about Splunk, I'm thinking about uh, CrowdStrike, almost all of them express uh, threat detection and workflow in a MITRE ATT&CK dashboard. Okay, so that's one thing that really helped. And then the second thing is, is it, it, it really does sort of help security practitioners 
achieve ubiquity. So if somebody really is familiar with the MITRE ATT&CK framework and they work for uh, Ernst Young, there's no reason they can't work for AT&T, you know, because they're really kind of thinking about how an adversary works. It gave a real structure to something that, you know, uh, it, 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 as you exactly said, a lexicon to something where people wanted to have their own proprietary ideas about how attackers work. This was like a logical step and you can map it. And, you know, and, and if there's a new adversarial technique, you can actually map it to the framework and it's extensible that way. So all the little things, I mean, uh, Russ articulated beautifully about how there's an offense and a defense uh, uh, paradigm with this. I'm just saying on a basic framework, it got everybody on the same page and it, and that, and that sort of matters too. Yeah. But we, you know, we had frameworks before, why, why, well, why sure. might I mean, in terms of, you know, at least describing some form of adversary behavior, why do, why do we think that, that MITRE attack had, had the, uh, the response it did in the industry? You know, cause it, it, unlike any other framework, I mean, it exploded, you know, uh, for, for a lack of better way to, to put it. You know, I think like somewhat of an answer on that one is also twofold of are we doing too much now with it? Are we trying to shove too much into it and let a good thing just be? And that's something because if you read some of these minor things, you're like, what? I, I guess. Sure. I mean, like, huh? Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's doing that. <laughs> like, come on. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad to do it. But like if you're expecting to have 100 percent coverage on that minor board, well, we're asking maybe you're then then top of that. So then there's some, there's a lot of pros as far as what what it's done. Yeah, adoption, as Chris put it, in terms of a lot of the the endpoint network vendors adopting the lexicon and its ubiquity amongst how we kind of, kind of discuss techniques. But what what's been some of the cons? What what's I think I think we've tried to put too much in some cases uh, into it. Um, if you look at, I mean, Chris actually alluded to this one. You've got, you know, the, the cloud concepts. Does it fit right. cloud? Does it fit? And I'm not saying it does or doesn't right now, but it's a very good question. Or does it need its own concept to this? Um, and I know that there's kind of a special like subsection of MITRE, right? That's kind of cloudish and still necessarily out there. So in in, in defense of, of, you know, MITRE attack stuff, it, it's, it's working. But um, I think the other piece to it is, the downside is 100% coverage. That's always been a big, you know, and you're kind of like, percentage of what coverage? What matters? I mean, because if you really like read through and try to get 100% coverage, on, I mean, like, and number one, you're going to be awesome, but it's, you're going to have to like, I need syscall events for half of this stuff and name a product or any data point that gets you syscall events. Right. Right. And, and, and the other problem, too, is uh, and it's not really a criticism, uh, but it, it's a human concern. So when people, you know, submit their platforms to MITRE, they are they, they almost like amp it all the way up for the detection element. Like it's uh, you know, it, it's great to find a detection and, and do things, but you still have to think about the workflow with it. Right. I mean, I, that I know that there's a problem is, is helpful, but can it is it meaningfully getting to the sim? Am I get creating meaningful alerts? You know, so I, I, you know, it's like anything else. People kind of learn to game the system a little bit. You know, I mean, so I'm, I am a little concerned that that that, that happens. But you know, on balance, I, I think why it took off, though, to your original question, yeah. there is more to you know to the the theme that you're using, threat informed defense and purple teaming, than just the idea of of just detection, right? It's really putting it back into people, processes, and technologies in a meaningful way, and also being able to quantify how your organization is progressing in your security posture over time, you know. So MITRE, MITRE gives you a great idea about how the attacker works, about how evidence is mounting, for lack of a better way to say it, about the next extrusion path where, you know, if you find that there's, you know, an initial access, you'd better start thinking about, you know, privilege escalation and you throw your next roadblock right at the at the attacker if you can. It isn't. It isn't all the way comprehensive. A hundred percent of anything is is a little bit lofty. But uh, again, I, I sing its praises, knowing yeah. that maybe a few notes are off key, for lack of. Definitely. And if you've heard me sing, off key is how I sing. So that's <laughs> that's how we work. <laughs> I, I, I would agree. I mean, like 
again, I, I was the first one to voice some opposition to it, right, and some doubt. But at the same time, I believe that it's done so much better, you know, and more for the industry in a good way than 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 bad. Um, we just have to make sure we are not overloading it at the same time in the future. Um, I think Chris also hit something I want to do. So was, was it's actually for us, at least the, the team that, that, that we look at it is, is, um, or a lot of our capabilities on this one is measuring the impact. And I think like, that's that quantifiable concept that like, I really like that Chris Rose said. And so, you know, our goal out of being able to do a lot of this is, is saying like, okay, so how can we measure the impact of something? What are the numeric values that actually tell us that? Did we have, how much of a percentage coverage? Where in the faces did we have it? Uh, where was something prevented versus something was detected? And, and kind of, we even, uh, like I said, start to attribute some of that along the miter attack phases, right? So you've got your, you know, the, the, the credential versus uh, persistence or, you know, like where inside of this whole thing did we actually catch something? But at the same time, it's it's really to actually understand again, what's the measurement of impact, right? It, did we, is it zero or is it a hundred or is it 75? Is it 20? Is it like, and, and that kind of also helps to then enable us to say, we're really weak in credential access or we're really weak in reconnaissance things and, you know, those kind of things that, that it's just, it's been really nice to be able to kind of structure a lot of things that aren't even inside of MITRE, but to MITRE. Yeah. Well, then, then where does, and maybe Russ, this is a question for you. Where is the, the line where, you know, one of, I think one of the criticisms that, that we're discussing with, with MITRE is that there's a perception that you have to have hundred percent coverage that you look at, um, you know, the framework and treat each TTP as, well, not only do I have coverage for that, but every single iteration of how it might, an attacker might implement that particular behavior and s drill down. And, you know, the term attack, you know, attack bingo has been, been used quite a bit where it's, it's it's in a negative form um, where you you get you know so enthralled and, and too obsessed with coverage of every TTP and you don't step back and talk the way that you're talking about it going how are we going to approach this from a strategic perspective you know so where does that line where's that line uh, you know blend I think part of that is also dependent upon the organization, right? There's going to be some yes. there's going to be some areas where it's really important to have it. I mean, we all want to catch it as early as possible. Let's be honest with ourselves. Like that is everybody's number one goal is how early can we move this whole thing and, and prevention detection. But at the same time, I mean, with the numbers and everything else we've got nowadays, uh, it's going to happen. And so where can you detect it and, and how long and what's that criticality to you and your organization? Uh, if you store nothing on your desktop and you catch it at persistence on your desktop, do we care as much? How much of a big deal is that versus if you store everything on there and you catch it at persistence, then maybe that's a little bit bigger of a deal. And so you've got to kind of understand where to your organization in enterprise, like what's the important piece to focus on side of that and then understand We've used it for measuring, are we off? Do we have good distribution of detections and protections across like maybe multiple angles that I've seen in the past? So um, are we getting too far in saying we've got a whole bunch of detections that are so focused around um, lateral movement, but we've got nothing on initial access? Well, maybe we need to shift things over there. So even just measuring a simple, like, where are your detections? What's the volume of them yes. by in a phase and saying, like, do we need to actually map it the other way? Are we spending too much time in something that does that the business doesn't necessarily need us to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, mean, I didn't give you a concrete answer does, because they, I just I don't think there no, is one. In many cases, there's never just one right answer to anything, right? But you know, again, perfect, perfect segue to start talking about a threat informed defense because the very way you're talking about approaching security is the approach strategically for an organization when they, they're they're thinking about how do we shift to you know um, adopting a threat informed defense. So that being said, maybe the best way I'd like to start that conversation is you know when you look at a security team in an organization. What does it what does it take to adopt a threat informed defense? You know, if you're a security team and you've got one person, two two individuals, no matter how how large an organization you are, can you adopt a threat informed defense? Uh, what does it actually take to start uh, adopting the str the strategies, the viewpoints, the rest, everything in the way that you were just talking? I mean, that mentality is, is key 
to taking on that those characteristics. But how does that start to happen? Chris may be a better person to Chris, answer that question. Me within his role. Why don't you go first. I know, I, and I think uh, I, I think there's a couple of simple things that you you sort of have to do first. I, you know, aside from MITRE, I think that you have to think of the SANS top 20 security controls, right? So part of your discipline is going to be pretty regular, it, the ability to inventory your assets, your software, your end users, right? I mean, if you if you do that, uh, people recommend once a month, and I think that's like the NIST standard. But if you do that even once a quarter, you're ahead of the game because at some point, no matter what happens from a security or an IT perspective, you're going to want to account for drifting your uh, environment. You're going to want to know what your golden state of your best configurations are. And when you do that, what it allows you to do is if there is a, a condition where, you know, you think you're under attack or you're really especially vulnerable, you have a real idea of what, you know, what assets the, you know, what the chain of custody that a, an attacker would have. So you can throw roadblocks in front of it, theoretically. Um, and more than anything else, you start controlling your blast surface. So I would argue that, you know, anything that has to do with today de detection actually has a prevention measure measure in front of it mm -hmm. are my s3 buckets secure uh you know do i have visibility over my ec2 instances or you know uh do i feel like my identity and access management allows me to do multi-factor authentication for for quick remediation um all, all of these seem like simple block and tackling but i'll tell you you know, block and tackling is hard to do. I think that the, the problem with the world is we have so many static controls over a fluid environment. You know, somebody gets a new OS and you don't know that it got all the way up to the to every computer. That means some of your computers are not visible. They're unmanaged. They're vulnerable. Um, so you, you really kind of have to have a, a sobriety on a high level, you know, thinking about things like continuous monitoring, ability to inventory things understanding, you know, how your computers are linked so that you can, uh, you know, uh, stop the blast surface and then train your employees to look for obvious things like phishing attacks and tell them to work within the network. Now, maybe Chris Kissel doesn't always work within the network. I mean, I get a little scared because every now and then you're at a productivity gap and you go, oh, my VPN's slow. You have to have intelligent discussions about all this. I don't know that I answered your question precisely, but I think I think it's partly a mindset. You know, I mean, it really is, you know, an idea that we have a discipline to understand our IT and, and network environment. I now, Russ, I defer to you on a on a more micro level. <laughs> I think one of the ways I've always seen it was even with like a kind of party of one, right? Is well, how do you prioritize? How do you know? Yes. And I think like that lets you start to actually make that decision. Do you need to add some prevention mechanism because something's happening? And so from a threat informed kind of concept, let's even remove the, the threat intelligence piece to this and just say, hey, attack technique, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And let's kind of put that in the mix and more the preventative mechanisms that Chris alluded to. Um, how do you know that it's actually working? How do we know when it stops working? Are we really sure that we didn't have something? And so I think from a threat informed side, that really does kind of also help even at a, you know, a body of one of being able to answer the question of, okay, I built something, but now how do I do a continuous validation concept of it? And is that working? And how can I know yes. when it fails? And if so, then do we need to prioritize something or let's even do, uh, you know, a, a kind of throw, throw in, attack technique number two around whatever it is that you have that's supposed to be preventing it. Does it prevent it? Does it not? How do we know? And so just even that kind of, hey, this is what I've built this thing, but I need to now validate this thing in some way. And being able to throw variants to that validation that says, maybe if we just changed it a little bit, it actually doesn't actually protect it. And so being able to know that, I think, from a threat informed side is even more valuable. Yeah. There's, so there's two elements I'd love to dive into with, with regards to what, what you're both saying. You know, one is the technical aspect of mechanisms involved in a threat informed defense. And the other is just sharing and collaboration. Because, you know, let's, let's take where you're a security team of one. 
actually it might be the easiest you know you have automation in play but hopefully but but uh but communication is pretty easy you gotta you know share with yourself uh in your team <laughs> but but it's not you know several other teams in silos maybe um across international borders so you know part of it is the communication aspect how, how have you both seen success with regards to security teams that want to adopt a threat informed defense and need to start involving other teams that maybe before they didn't communicate with or their CISO, their CIO, the other kind of management structures to, to help them understand the benefit of adopting kind of this strategy. So, you know, two questions there. It's, it's one from both kind of a technical, tactical, operational perspective, you know, now working with teams that before you didn't have to, because taking on a threat informed defense is very much about collaboration. And the other aspect is, as that's, you know, moving forward, uh, getting buy off from kind of strategic leadership in the change in culture that that might, you know, mean. How have you seen success? Well, I, you know, the, the, the question makes me grin because I think, uh, you know, when, well, it, grin is maybe a, a morose sense of humor because I think about April 2020 when, for all intent and purposes, everybody went home and we started working remotely. And the most important security tool was Slack, you know, or Teams or Zoom. And it, it had nothing to do, it, it just had something to do with basic communications and putting things together. I, you know, you, you sort of can't, you can't piecemeal an environment. You sort of have to look at it all in once, right? It's not like, you you know, even when we think about the MITRE attack framework and everything else, you have to do things sort of in a in a very important contextual way. Like you you have to understand that your, your configurations are on time. You have to understand how a specific breach goes. So I, I think that you have to do that through some sort of platform. Uh, and I know that, you know, we'll end up talking about this a little bit, but, you know, the idea of doing pen testing all the time, that sounds fantastic, except pen tests tend to be very narrow and they tend to be, you know, they, they seem to be specific, but they cover a very small piece of area. And usually you have to give real estate to the pen testers, you know, like say, hey, we'll, we'll devote this part of the network because that may actually affect operations, you know. So you have to have a way to do some some automated defense or automated threat simulation without being uh, invasive and taking CPU but, but, uh, space Chris, from the let network. Me, let me ask you, and, you know, as you're talking, oh, yes. whether it's it's any kind of testing, whether it's using external tests, That's right. pen test pest, pen testing firms, internal, you know, having an internal pen testing team, having you know, notion of of, uh, of some type of you know red, red teaming aspect, having. A, nation platform, you'll get That's these right. results. And as Russ was saying before, you know, it will then um, help inform you to make different decisions. Now, it's uh, as you were, be you know, when we began kind of talking, you had talked about the complexities in the environments. And so now it's no longer one team. It might right. be that there was the testing team that gets the results. They have to go now talk to a policy team that's in charge of the endpoints overseas. I'm kind of curious as to how that's not worked in some cases and worked and what teams have to go through. Because pen testing, I think, suffers from the same and the results and the reports suffer from the same aspects of any type of testing. In this regard, when we're talking about threat form, it's just con more continuous and it's and we're trying to, you know, bring in automation and it's uh it's it's no longer the days of pen testing firm comes in either from an external perspective or internal and hands you a report. Right. There's there's now a lot lot faster kind of iterative approach to this. Certainly. And so, you you know, obviously you're going to have to be wildly integrated with SIM, SOAR, EDR tools, right? You know, I mean, so that you could get back into the workflow. So if you're, you know, if you're working, you know, if you have results that you can uh, plug and play might be a little bit aggressive, but I mean, certainly, uh, you, you know, you can use those tools in a service now ticketing idea or, you know, so you can take those results, you can actually implement whatever changes that you find from the result and then run the simulation again. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's still nothing like practice, practice, practice. So I think integration is a wildly important part of it. And, you know, the other part is cultural. And I, I think it is changing in part from COVID is that the truth of the matter is, uh, you, you know, security teams, DevOps teams, and IT teams 
have to think of themselves on the same side, right? It's not, if I'm a security guy and I tell you to patch something, I don't mean like you patch it or you're, you're, you're let's think about when we can do that. Um, if we need to reconfigure some firewall rules, this is sort of an all hands, everybody involved at the same time. So you need to do it through tooling and you needed to do it within, you know, within the egresses, within the, within the culture of your mm -hmm. own, of your own organization. I I think also like I look at it like this, the pen test red team kind of concept in this and, and you could even pull that world apart a little bit and say like, you know, there's a, there's an element to red teaming pen testing, however you want to define this concept of exercising you know, business logic, right? Like disaster recovery concepts, all that other stuff, right? There, there's an angle in there that does this thread informed and emulation kind of concept fit in that maybe, maybe not, but one of the biggest things that, uh, and Stefan, this is something that you and I spoke about many years ago that I didn't realize until I actually hit the, the commercial sector was businesses were more interested in some of the decision-making logic out of a bad guy, right? Why did I go left versus right? What made me actually, you know, make that, that, that intuition that I had to say, I'm going to do this versus that. And that's where I would say like the emulation, this adversary and this automation concept actually does benefit us is because if I can go develop 40 different credential harvesting techniques and then deploy an agent to how many places we need to actually run this, run it and collect the data. I've done that in 10 minutes and I can now give you that data. I can give you the logic out of what I would do next. And maybe your next step is just as automated as the, the credential. But now I've taken it from doing one thing and I have to do it manually and all this other stuff to, I just did it in 40 in less than 30 seconds or whatever, you know, the, the time slot is. And you just kind of enabled this concept of like, can I find the bad things that much quicker from a red team perspective? And that puts us back on, like what Chris said, the same side as the individuals that are actually having to say, like, does it work or does it not? And so maybe, you know, breaking that down. And that's the piece that I think has not really been embraced at scale and constant. All we're talking about here is just automation, right? Like in the end, that's just automation, but it's frameworks to enable this code bases, you know, what are agents, various other kind of concepts that allow us to be able to do this. But it really takes apart your classic thought process of pen testing red team and, you know, really dismantles it and says like, maybe we only need it for business this and maybe it's for finding bugs and bad things across our configuration, everything else. Maybe we can do that in a more efficient manner. Maybe we can do that in a, in a more automated mm -hmm. approach. Every shop's going to have to answer. The Maine is that smart. I no, I, well, I just wanted to comment on how smart when you said it, like something went off in my head. If I actually look at the data, it will suggest to me where the adversary may go. If they feel that there's a, a specific weakness in, uh, well, password's an easy one, but if they feel, you know, see a specific weakness in a, a IDS IPS, uh, if they see a specific weakness in EDR, that, you know, once you get the data, that kind of helps you figure out how to firm it up, whether the attack is coming left or right, where a potential zero day is, we, you know, a, a novel attack could come from. I uh, I kind of appreciate the idea. I, you know, so, I you know, I, I'm just that makes me say, you know, more nice things about attack IQ. I, as I, it's just a little nuance that I hadn't really thought about, you know, earlier. Very cool, Russ. It, it's been something that changed my mind of just like, well, can I automate me? How much, how much faster can I make yeah. decisions to tell a business or the business employees me of like, I need to do this versus that, or I would have done this. Or like, turns out you're got credentials everywhere over here that you, turns out 30 things work against your 40. And man, I got 30 different ways to get credentials. And then if I feed those into like another 30 different lateral movement techniques, does it work? If so, did yeah. I just speed the game up? Did I just speed the, how do I answer the questions to my own problems that much faster? Yeah, to derail the conversation just briefly, if they automate me, there's going to be a whole lot less beer and nachos in this world. <laughs> so, I mean, but that, that's, that's what I contribute to it. You know, <laughs> um, you know when, 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 uh, when the results come though, from this, this kind of adopting a threat informed defense and, you know, Russ, if, if, if you're both, you know, the one that's kind of running, running the, the, the security testing program and the one who's the recipient, it's easy. But if you're now communicating to different teams of the business, 
I'm curious how you've you've had success because ultimately you kind of said the business wants to know more, and they've actually started to take notice uh, about adversary craft and 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 behavior and controls, and there's a lot of investment being made, obviously, and has been for some time on detection, prevention, response controls. Um, they want to know that things are working um, and want to be proactive. And I think that's more and more the case. How, how are different stakeholders, how have you seen success in communicating to different stakeholders? Numbers. I think like that's kind of big, that is, you know, it kind of removes mysticism. It helps to just understand it and say like, Hey, we saw good success. We didn't see good success, whatever your numbers are just kind of out there and then being open with how you generate those numbers. Um, so uh, percentage of success, denial, whatever it may be. And especially from like this angle and add, you know, being able to automate uh, or leverage the automation to actually compute those and verify that is really good. Like, do we have detection efficacy in certain things? Do we have uh, configuration efficacy over here? What happens if it, you know, right? Like that kind of helps to remove this. I ran 30 techniques, 40 techniques, and only one worked. Right, they went way or versus the other, but again, numbers are numbers. It worked or it didn't work, and so I think helping with a metrics kind of conversation is usually really good. That helps to like maybe just remove some of the people bias concepts that show up in this, especially especially when you throw the red teaming kind of piece into it, and you can maybe remove that because that becomes very adversarial in some organizations. Right? Is is you know is a number kind of element being honest about those numbers being able to be transparent about those numbers and say like the machine does it you can test it all you right. want here it is you know here's the data points does that help you're, with actually breaking saying, down you know this, like hashtag math is objective of... right it's like it, let's <laughs> you know <laughs> i never i never in my career thought i'd ever say it metrics right like i never once in my life ever <laughs> thought i would say that but I, i'll be honest with you i think like that really does kind of help in being able to, you know, uh, let others understand and see that impact. Yeah, and I'll I'll add some superfluous things because Russ's point is is more important than what I'm going to say. But there's still very human things that happen. So everybody, it, literally, we know that about this time last year was the Colonial Pipeline breach. These are things that anybody who watched the news knows. We know that they, you know, we, we, well, we suspect that they paid about $5 million in ransomware. We suspect that half of that was covered. You know, all these are lightly, you know, uh, thinly veiled reports. So all of a sudden, you know, the, the effect this time around was that, you know, it took about a week to get gas in the, you know, Southwest, Southeast United States. And, uh, you know, cybersecurity now raises to the level of line of business. It raises to the level of, you know, mergers and acquisitions, it's now a C-level, it's always been a C-level problem, but it gets to very, very visible, you know, embarrassment points. And so on a human level, if you, if, well, and, you know, uh, Stefan, you would know this better than most, there's going to be mistakes in an organization. What you hope to say is, did we do everything that we could in a reasonable and intellectual context, and if we did, you're you know you're less you're, you're less likely to get angry with an employee or a system or a process, and you know you, you have to maximize in cybersecurity you have to maximize that opportunity, and maybe a year or two from now we and we, we the things we can't control is what you know what role cyber insurance will put play, what role regulators are going to play, so the degree to which you can say. These are the things that I did to augment my controls. These are the things that I did to, you know, really test my environment. Uh, what you're, you know, what you took on a fiduciary responsibility level, that that mitigates fines. It, 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 it helps with human costs. It helps you be better the next time around. So there's really a holistic thing. I mean, more than just a, what, what Russ said more intelligently, but the, these these secondary and tertiary considerations in a world that's more and more digital daily, those matter, you know? We talk a lot at Attack IQ about this 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 notion of uh, data-driven decision-making. Um, and, you know, from what both of you are saying um, throughout the, this this last, you know, 30, 40 minutes, a threat-informed defense is, is, is essentially, you know, a strategy and an approach that is uh, going to help create the metrics, create the numbers, to drive decisions less about just pure opinions um, 
and to, to kind of look at look at the numbers, whether that's uh, coverage um, uh, of a particular set of controls against adversary behavior, um, gaps in Russ, as you had put it, certain tactic areas, uh, maybe an over over investment in in other areas that. Um, you know, the, the team wasn't aware of until they actually get together and start talking and thinking in the way of discussing, well, what's our threat? What's the adversary? What controls have we put in place? So there's a lot of teams out there. I mean, we, we run into it all the time who, who don't think this way um, and, and don't think the way that we've been having this conversation, you know, as, the, as they're watching, as they're watching, you know, this conversation and getting kind of excited about what it could mean if they brought information back to their team, to their manager, to their CISO, um, or if this, you know, if the CISO is watching right now, and, and trying to trying to understand what do they need to do to change? How do you go from kind of where we started the conversation of talking about legacy security teams, which many many teams are still, you know, acting very differently than a threat informed defense, and start evolving? Where do you begin? What's what's the first place? I mean. It's not overnight. So, what's the first step, and 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 the second step after that? I'll, I'll answer real quickly. I think Russell have a better answer as a practitioner, but I, I will say that you have to start trusting some of your automations. I mean, not just necessarily security ones, but you know the degree to which, you know, I, I, especially for smaller organizations, quit in time on a small organization might be five oh five on a Friday. We think that there's something wrong on the network before people could get onto the network, multi-factor authenticate in. Just go ahead and don't have somebody approve that MFA. There's some small things that you can do and learn to the degree to which you can trust automation. Um, and as you get more and more comfortable, increase your automation footprint. And then, um, you know, really try, try to build a culture where things are not necessarily adversarial. It doesn't, you know, I, I, you know, I admit it, like when I ask for promotions, I go by, hey, here's what revenues we bring in. Here's the things I solve. But in truth, um, you know, you really have to think about where did the team go? Where did this thing, you know, um, if, so, you know, if a patch, it, it, things like firewall patch management, things that are ITOT shared, make sure that the goal is to get a better overall result rather than IT versus OT versus DevOps. I think it's still mindset, you know, and I think that, you know, the, the degree to which you, you can you, you could put purple teaming together is sort of a mindset that there is a always a, you know, an outside looking in and, you know, and a protection element in everything that you do. That was my that was my two cents. Uh, let's talk to the adult, Russ. Like I mean, I think he's got the room, probably a better idea with this. <laughs> to think. Yeah, <laughs> put that on you. It's not frequent. Um, <laughs> you can ask my children. <laughs> um, you know, there's there's several ways about that, and I, I think about it like at uh, almost like at a tactical level, at a business level, and I think really almost every one of them comes down to personality, right, and the human element out of it. And and Chris alluded to this and the, the, that adversarial kind of piece. Uh, that some, you know, offensive-ish concepts really bring in. But even then, it's a trust relationship, right? Does that person trust you? Do you have a good relationship with them? So I think there's a, a human level that can't be ignored inside of this. Um, the threat-informed side of that is, is once you've built that trust, right, in that, that – relationship that are poor, then we can start to have conversations about, well, what does it mean? Do we do numbers? Do we not do numbers? Do we look at by attack phases? Do we not look at by attack and phases? Yes, you know, when you say we, who, who is that on the security team? You know, it, it really kind of depends upon where we're at what level we want to talk about this. I can talk at it like a more tactical level on some of the ways I've done things where, um, again, I have been fortunate enough in the past to be part of places where you know, they took ideas and said, hey, we like that. Why don't you go ahead and go with it, Russ? Where um, one of them was, you know, if I was kind of on more of the offensive via side, even like I really am starting to look at like I'm not sure any of us are really kind of doing that um, and versus the defensive side right and there, that adversarial relationship. Well, how do I break that down? And one of the ways I did that was just simply by an open kind of like code sharing concept and, and wikis and everything else where there was a lot of transparency. And why I say that is because if I, as a bad guy, am sitting here supposed to be doing certain kind of techniques and learning certain things, 
you know, a lot of the time on the defensive ish side, that's where the adversarial relationship comes in. And well, if I give you the data and I give it to you as fast as I absolutely can, meaning technique, knowledge, whatever it may be that I'm doing, and I can give you that early, then there's a whole level of transparency there to the individual. And they're going like, hey, you can be empowered. You want to build a detection or prevention of whatever it may be, you do it. And then it, from the same thing, it's like a red team kind of perspective is you're not also like harboring like all these little like techniques and exploits and everything else and kind of like I'll unleash this and show them. And so if we remove that element, right, that that trust element kind of say, here's more of a transparency. Now, if you catch it or if it prevents it, inside of some engagement hey all the more merrier right like that means everything worked i'm paid to kind of defend and help build the, the strength of the company and as fast as i can do that if i can do that quicker today then man i think we've won versus like if i harbor some of that stuff from the offensive angle then i'm not really doing anybody good so between now and two months from now when an engagement starts and that thing happens to us and i knew about it for two months i mean that's not helping the organ the business that you're actually part of and so there's an angle there that says okay you know maybe that angle if you look at it from let's do it from more of like an engineer architecture perspective right like there's a lot of like well i built it that way so it shouldn't do it right it won't do that i can tell you that it won't do that and chris alluded to this in the past like networks are living breathing kind of things you know lives out of themselves and you know uh you know, shoulder was good one day and you know four months from now my shoulder's not near as good right that that happens i mean that's just part of natural you know life and breathing and what being able to kind of express and work to that saying like i i'm just here to make sure that's that case right and breaking some of those down and being able to again now say like let's put it in more of an engineer architecture concept like it's just code you can see the same code I'm going to. We're going to measure that concept. We're going to let it know when it doesn't. When that thing skews outside of the norm that we want it to, you've now got the, the data to it. So if there's somewhat of a trust relationship there, and what can I find um, as the trust relationship? What is that common kind of element that we can do? So I, even then, I, I think like this adversary emulation stuff helps in that side of that because, again, it boils down the – the personal angle of a lot of this meaning it's it's code you can see it it's not you know there's nothing there's nothing hidden about this mm -hmm. it's literally a code base you can see it we'll find out and we'll fix the problem yep no well said well said um chris any any closing remarks uh no i think there's um high optimism i i, I do wonder on an industry level uh, the degree to which we, we could become a little more egoless. I think that there is a kind of a sharing between, and I, you know, I know that there's always like a cynicism, but a, a sharing between, uh, things that government is learning with, uh, private enterprise to make the whole security stack better. Um, and I also think that, you know, uh, it, it's actually a time of high optimism on balance for cybersecurity. I, our analytics are getting better are, you know, uh, we, we've kind of become a little more humble to the real world. Um, and, and I'm hoping that there's long-term goodness with all of it. Russ, any, anything else you want to add? Um, you know, it, it takes a different mindset, right? There's a shift of mindset with a lot of this stuff. And being open to that, I think, is the important part. And, you know, we've seen the industry for sure over this, the term even purple, right, uh, uh, be adopted more over the past you know, four or five, six years, somewhere in there. And um, even then, that's still a loose determination. Hey, we can't even define what red team means versus pen test still. I mean, come on, 20 years later. So I think like that loose and being open-minded a little bit and being also willing to kind of challenge the thought process of like, why would we do it the same way? I mean, what if we what if we made that much better in 20 years plus? right? By some of the same things over and over again, do we need to change them? So of course, it's not to say that they're bad. It's just, do they need to be tweaked a bit? Do we need to actually take strengths of cloud computing and multi-tenancy and all these other kind of concepts in it and, and uh, technology and look at them just a tiny bit differently to look to measure 
what it is that security is actually doing for us and what is a threat piece inside of all of that look like so i think like that would be my biggest encouragement because from that if you've got that then i think you know a lot of the tooling nowadays is at your fingertip there's a lot of open source stuff out there you have miter stuff you've got the calderas you've got how many other like there's a lot of other tooling that isn't necessarily even like um you know product based or i mean yeah that, that, that's, that's product based that well, is, started for sure yeah yeah and so i think like being able to do that and and approach that from the beginning that like with that and all these tools and again use a land, aws lambda to measure it who cares i mean yeah. but being able to like you said you've got a plethora of tools and, and techniques and everything else to kind of look at doing this and i would encourage like, like i said just look at the problem set a tiny bit differently yeah yeah well, thanks to you both for your viewpoints. Um, I had fun. I uh, hope you did too. Um, for those of you watching and listening, um, I hope this encourages you to, uh, to kind of get excited and, and, and start adopting a, a threat-informed defense into practice. And as, as both Chris and, and Russ alluded to, this, this will involve a shift in mindset of the security team. Um, but that's exciting. So thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan. Nice, nice working with you, Russ. You too, Chris.